All right, I'm freaking out. <laughs> I'm, serious, I'm serious. Like, not even like a witty opener. I am straight up bugging out. Like, I'm excited, and I'm nervous, and I'm overwhelmed, and it's all wrapped up into the big gooey ball that is me. A couple weeks ago, when, when, um, when this church graciously offered me the opportunity to come on and, and start teaching every week, um, I didn't, I didn't have a, a lot of chance to tell a lot of people it's happening so quick and there's some other things going on with the other, you know, roles that I play and different, different responsibilities that I have. And then all of a sudden it was out there on Facebook, which means it's, it's totally official now. <laughs> and, um, but I did have one friend um, that I, I reached out to and, and um, he's just kind of known my journey. He's known me back when, when I was just beginning in ministry. He's kind of prayed for me and seen me at different stages. He's, he's been at different churches that I've been at. He's spoken there. I've spoken with him. We've spoken together. And, and uh, I, I shot him a, a text. And I was like, hey man, guess what is going on? Like here's this thing that's happening and this church has offered me an opportunity to come and teach with him over in Franklin. He's like, oh, well, which church is it? I said, the gathering. And he just goes, dude, David Foster was the best communicator I've ever heard. It's <laughs> like, thanks, friend. Like, we, he's like my oldest friend that I keep in touch with. Like, you know, we talked over the years, you know? And then it was like all the time people popping me text messages and phone calls and emails and stuff on Facebook. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, David Foster was the best. <laughs> thanks for the support. So then I made the stupid mistake of going, well, you know, I really need to kind of grasp David's voice. And so I went on and started reading his blog. And then I started going, I am way out of my league here. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, you know, I'll just listen to a couple of his sermons. Dude, you guys are screwed. Here I am. <laughs> you guys suckers. Can you believe it? I am like way, can't believe I'm here. And like, then I started getting like all introspective. And I was like, all right, let me just think of like, you know, you know, why I'm ready to do this and maybe some reasons why I'm not. Like I came up with all these reasons of why I shouldn't be up here. Like I've watched Drumline way more times than a person my age, a man my age should have watched it. If Wilson Phillips Hold On comes on right now, I'm stopping the sermon. I'm going to start singing, people. My 80s and, and early 90s cassette collection. Yeah, I said cassettes. Has Belle Biv DeVoe, Another Bad Creation, Boys to Men, Motown Philly. Like, that's the sound of my youth. I shouldn't be up here, people. I shouldn't be doing this. My food pyramid is pizza, Sour Patch Kids, and cappuccinos. That's good health for me. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> if we want to talk Star Wars trivia, it's on. I shouldn't be up here. I am so unqualified for this. If I were to take off my jacket and my shirt, I'm not going to, but I said if I would, you'd realize that, that I have an inordinate amount of body hair. It's like a Wookiee had a baby with a Greek person. And then they wrapped a fur around it. That's what I look like under this. I sweat a lot. I get ingrown hairs often. What's up? I shouldn't be here. And to really get serious, I struggle with sin a lot. I'm recovering from struggles and addictions that plagued me. I'm a mess, people. I am a hot mess. So here's my list. Wookie, sinner, <laughs> not nearly as good as David, ever, like not going to get there. And then I came up with my pro list, like why I should be here, why I'm qualified to do this. I came up with one. If I haven't freaked you out enough already, I only came up with one reason of why I should be here. And it's this. God's grace changed my life. Amen. God's mercy changed my life. God's mercy can change anyone that it comes into contact with. For all the reasons I shouldn't be here, that's the only reason that matters. 
And don't think that it's lost on me, the footsteps of the man that I am following. How he lived mercy and breathed mercy and preached mercy and grace and goodness. It is not lost on me. The, 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 the shadow that he casts, and I'm thankful for it because you're better for it as a church. You're better for it as people. It's not lost on me, the woman that I get to, to go shoulder to shoulder with into the fight to take the message of Jesus Christ and the platform of this church into the community for Paula and, and for so many of you that have hung in there the last few years. And it's just simply sh through her and your just sheer prayer and willpower that you guys are here today. Amen. Praise be to God for that. It's not lost on me what you guys have been through. And it is my sincere joy for all of my deficiencies, for all of my inadequacies. It is my sincere joy to be able to be here because God's mercy changes lives. And we've got to show up and say it again and again and again and again. So for all the steps you've been on, I'm glad I get to be here on this step and together start this partnership because we have a message of mercy that must be told. And so with that in mind, I, I want to show two verses today that proclaim that, that hopefully give us a, a good place to push off together. As we move forward, and if you have a Bible, um, we're going to go to the book of Romans. We're going to have it on the screen. I think it's in the worship guides. If you have it on your phone, your tablet, you know, however you want to look at it and see it, um, we'll find ways to get it to you. But in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we're going we're gonna to peek through those this morning and, and kind of see those. And I think that these are, are two verses that display how much God's mercy changes people. We need to be reminded, if, if you're not familiar with Romans, it's written by a guy named Paul. He was um, an intense missionary, church planner, pastor, teacher, preacher, who shook the world shortly after Jesus died, came out of the grave, and then ascended into heaven. It was actually Jesus who confronted Paul, drawing out, out of his life of sin and selfishness and religion, and changed him. And Paul wrote 75% of the New Testament. And of those books that he wrote that we find in the second half of the Bible, this one is considered his masterpiece. Most, most writers and thinkers and, and kind of Christian smarty farties, they say that this is the most valuable and complete book in all the Bible. It is Paul's Magna Carta. This is Paul's 12th Symphony. I read one, one statement about it said this, that, that the book of Romans is like, it's compressed declarations of vast truths and they're like coiled springs that once they're loosed, they leap forward through the mind and the heart to fill the reader's horizons and to shape their life. This is Paul's masterpiece. And he was writing it to an audience that were called Gentiles. These were people that, that weren't Jewish. They, they weren't part of the nation that God revealed his plan to in the Old Testament. They're seen as outsiders. They're newbies to the concept of, of, of salvation. They weren't familiar wholly with scripture. They were checking out, in a lot of them, they were checking out what this church, what this grace, what this Jesus thing was. And the Roman church that Paul's writing to here was one that he longed to see. He actually wrote it before he ever saw them with his own eyes and stood with them and preached to them and taught with them and heard from them. He longed to get there, but if we look through Paul's story, shown mostly in the book of Acts, just earlier in the New Testament, it says that he was kind of held up again and again. He was actually taken to Rome as a prisoner. And so he is longing to get there because he believes in this church and the opportunity they have and the potential they have. And he wants to see them live as one body. And he wants to he them to hear about grace and hear about mercy. He wanted them to hear the gospel because the gospel is the overflow of God's love. It's the gospel that gives us a clue of God's ultimate purpose for salvation, both personally and throughout the world. This letter was his letter of preparation before he came there and began to teach with them. And he's trying to tell them something. 
He's trying to tell them that the church has been somewhere and the church is going somewhere. And I think if Paul was writing not to the church at Rome, but to the church of the gathering today, he would say the very same thing, that this is a church. We are a people who have been somewhere and we still have the opportunity to go somewhere. But we've got to look back at where we've been personally and as a community before we can ever start to go, all right, what's our next step? What's our next step? Where do we go next? We've got to look back at where we've been as a people and as a person. And so what I want us to do today is that we're going to look back and we're going to look forward. We're going to see, oh, the places we've been and oh, the places that we're going to go. And we're going to use Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 as, as a guide for that. So let me read a, a little bit for us and we'll kind of pick this apart as we move along. Paul says this in verse 1 of chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore... Now, anytime you see a therefore in, in Scripture, this is just good Bible reading as you potentially do it on your own. It's been very transformational in my life. But anytime you see the word therefore, you need to ask your, yourself a question. What is the therefore, therefore? He's telling us something here. But we don't get it with the full context because we're just reading these two verses. So what's the therefore, therefore? Well, if I can give you in a nutshell, we we won't have time to kind of give you a full layout of the book of Romans because it's so thick and dense. Maybe we'll take about six years in the future and go verse by verse and chapter by chapter through it, but not today, not this month, okay? But but if I can give you a thumbnail sketch here, Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 11 was the first part of this book. And within it, Paul gave the depths of the gospel, the the depths of mercy. Chapters 1 through 11 are called the fullest and grandest and most comprehensive statement of the gospel, of the good news found anywhere in the Bible. So when Paul is setting up here, when he gets to chapter 12, he says, now I I appeal to you, therefore... He's saying, I appeal to you based on everything that I've said in chapters 1 through 11. Everything that's come up to this point, I'm giving you there. And what he's doing is he's laying out a case against us that we don't deserve the grace and the mercy that's been given to us, but it has been. And he's saying, that's a great thing. It's a transformational thing. It's a life-changing thing. So what he does in chapters 1 through 11 is he sets the stage and in chapter 12 and then on, he enters in what's called the practical stage. He begins to say, based on what I've been talking about, now we start to put it into practice in our own lives. That's what he's after here. So he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. To be shown mercy is a powerful thing. It means we don't deserve what's being given to us. In fact, we deserve judgment. We deserve pain. We deserve death. Anybody who's a child of the 80s and was formed by the movie The Karate Kid knows what mercy is. Because at the end of The Karate Kid, Master Kreese from the evil Cobra Kai Dojo has attacked Daniel's son, our hero, the young Ralph Macchio, And Mr. Miyagi, Daniel's teacher, trainer, mentor, friend, comes in to save him and puts a a Korean beatdown, an Okinawan beatdown on Master Kreese. And Mr. Miyagi has his hand in the air and he's got Master Kreese down on his knees and he says, death or mercy. And Master Kreese, because he's a huge coward, says mercy. And Mr. Miyagi goes, hi! And you know what he does next? Does anybody know? He honks his nose. He goes, hey, honk. He gives him mercy. He didn't have to. Master Christ didn't deserve it, but he shows mercy. To me, other than, I guess, Romans chapter 1 through 11, that's the grandest view of mercy. It's powerful when it's shown to us. Paul's first 11 chapters of this are are a case against you and I that we don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve grace. We don't deserve love. In fact, we deserve the penalty for it. But God in his mercy shows us love, grace, goodness. And what Paul's saying is here is he's saying, I appeal to you based on the mercy that we don't deserve, but we've been given We've got to live this out. What he's saying to you and I and to this church is based on the mercy that's been shown to us. 
If the result is God shows us no mercy, we don't have to live any of this out. But I've experienced mercy that I don't deserve. Many of you have experienced mercy and grace that you don't deserve. So we need to start to focus in on how we live this out, how this becomes an attitude of our life. So Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice to whoever was listening here. To whoever was sitting in the audience as this was read or preached or taught, they would have been like, whether they were Jew or Gentile, somewhere in between, they would have been like, yeah, sacrifice, I get that. I've seen the altars where they bring bulls and goats in and or they sacrifice a lamb and that, that blood kind of helps me get through that day, kind of atones for my sin for, for the next week or month. You know, I can kind of pull it through for a little while, maybe get my act together. But Paul doesn't say, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bulls or goats or doves or lambs or cats if you're a dog person or dogs if you're a cat person. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, I appeal to you to present you, to present your bodies, my body. Paul doesn't say bulls. He says something completely different and radical. What he's saying here is based on Romans chapter 1 through 11, the old way of sacrifice doesn't work. There's a greater sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus. And based on that sacrifice, our only response is when we're touched by that mercy then to present ourselves in that same way. The new sacrifice after Jesus is you. It's me, it's us as a church. We have a challenge here before us to make a decisive dedication of ourselves as worshipers, stepping forward and placing a radical offering on the altar. And the altar is this, the altar is Jesus. Based by his example on the cross, by his blood, by his sacrifice, we now go to that same altar and the sacrifice is you. It's me, it's us, saying good, bad, ugly, and everything in between. Here I am, this is what I am, and I bring myself because mercy has changed me. And the audience, those watching, it's the world. They're wanting to see if we're really putting that grace, that mercy, that truth into action. One of the people that I read getting ready for today, um, he's a writer, a Christian thinker, his name's Robert Mounts. He said that the church should stand out from the world as a demonstration of God's intention for the human race. Our job, our role as the gathering is to stand out as people impacted so deeply by mercy, so deeply by grace that, that when people come in here, they don't go, man, that band's really good. Man, that teaching pastor is sexy. They come in here and they go, whoa, what they're talking about here, what these people are saying, that's what mercy looks like. I've been wondering, I've been searching for this. This is our mission, friends. This is our mission, people. This is what we become about as a church, displaying what God's intention was all along. Now notice that Paul, nowhere in this says that the, the Roman church or the church of the gathering is gonna do it right all the time, is going to say it well all the time. It doesn't say that we're going to be perfect all the time. We aren't going to be. We're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. Lord knows I'm going to make tons of mistakes. We're not going to always get it right. We're not going to always show the most love, the deepest connection, the most forgiveness. But Paul says every day we show up and we try to do it better than we did before. We try to do it better than we did before. We try to be impacted by mercy more so we can show mercy more. We try to, to be impacted by grace more so we can show grace more. What he's saying here to us individually and to us as a community is we've seen where we've been in need of mercy, totally deserving of judgment. And now we lay our lives down so that others can understand that same mercy the mercies of God is where we've been. And by grasping it and by showing it, we know a little bit more and more and more about where we're going. We've got to know where we've come from to ever get an idea of where we're going. And we've come from a place in need of mercy and through God's love, we've been shown mercy. 
So to understand oh, the places we're going, we've got to know oh, the places we've been. But when we get to that place and we start to get mercy more and more and understand it more and more and show it more and more, then we start to get a gauge of where we're headed, what we're doing, what this is all about. We start to see, oh, the places that we're going to go. And this isn't all at once. It's not all at a sudden like, okay, you got mercy. Here's your map. It's you've got mercy to make it through this morning, this day. You've got mercy to make it through this minute, this breath. And the next place you're going is just one more step. One more right decision. One more good action. That's where we're headed to next. But the more that becomes a rhythm of who we are, the more we start to see that laid out before us. So daily we come back to this reminder to appeal to the mercies of God, to lay our lives as a living sacrifice. This is our worship. And Paul gives a challenge here in verse 2. He says, do not be conformed. When I was in elementary school, a young eight, nine-year-old, a fashion trend swept through Carradale Elementary School. Everybody who was anybody had to have parachute pants because Michael Jackson wore parachute pants. So I, of course, needed parachute pants. Now, I was the kind of kid oblivious to how hard my parents worked and how much money they did or didn't make. You know, I just, when I wanted something, I was like, go get money. That's how it works, right, mom, dad? We always got what we needed. We didn't always necessarily get what we wanted. Even when you're the baby and the youngest, the only boy, you should get parachute pants. They look awesome with the Air Jordans that I didn't have either. Somehow I chipped away at my mom. I don't remember how long it took, but she took me off to JCPenney's because that's where classy people shop. And we went into the, the, the young boys section where the, the sizes are broken down, small, medium, large, and husky. And we went to the husky section and there, sure enough, were some parachute pants. But I didn't realize even in the husky section, there's husky and then there's extra husky. I was more on the extra husky side. And the parachute pants that I wanted, that I needed, that I had to have, were a size too small for me. My mom's like, those aren't going to fit. I was like, oh, they're going to fit. They're going to look awesome. She's like, look, if you can get into those, we'll buy them. <laughs> so I went back into the dressing room, and I tried every which way to get my jelly into <laughs> this. But Jay-Z Penny's wasn't ready for this jelly. It wasn't at all. But I was cramming, I was shoving, I was trying to work it into those pants. This is back in the days when the, 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 the dressing rooms had those like swivel doors like an Old West movie. And sure enough, it actually looked like I was in an Old West movie because I came out like this, you know, like, because I couldn't bend my legs. <laughs> my mom's like, those do not look comfortable. They look awesome, mom. You can't bend your legs. Why do I need to bend my legs? Who needs circulation when you're nine? You know, you're all malleable at that point. I was trying to force and push myself into something that I thought I had to have to be something in the world. Paul warns us of a similar thing, but it's more dangerous to us as people and us as a church. He says, do not be conformed to the world. To be conformed is to squeeze yourself into a mold. And when we start to squeeze ourselves into a mold, taking moral and ethical cuts and, 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 and shortcuts, and we start to act a certain way or talk a certain way when we're with a certain type of people, or we don't, we don't bring forth this mercy that's changed us as, as much. We start to go all these, when we were forcing and pushing ourselves into a mold that that wasn't made for us. The danger here is when we do this, we lose sight of the fact that grace is moldless. There's no mold to grace. There's no mold to love. There's no mold to mercy. When grace and mercy pour out to you and I, it's saying that you are loved just the way you are. You are accepted just the way you are. You can have purpose before God just the way you are. When grace pours out, it accepts you and I where we are and says, that's what you are. That's who you are. Now receive this mercy, receive this grace and move forward. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The opposite of conformity is transformation. 
Real transformation comes from within rather than trying to get something outside into a certain mold. And it's not enough for us to go, I, I don't want to act like this anymore. I don't want to talk like this anymore. I don't, want to, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to try to be like the world anymore. It's one thing to say those things. It's another thing to pray those things and allow them to transform us from the inside out. Paul shows us here when he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. He tells us the key. The key is the renewal of our mind. Our mind is the key. This is where we start to wage war with accepting mercy, seeing where we've come from, realizing where we're going. It's the renewal of our mind. It's thinking of where we've been, who we are, and what God might have for us in the future. And we see, the more we think and renew our mind, we see that it's only God's mercy that loves you this way. It's only God's mercy that meets you here accepts you here. And what Paul's telling us here to do is says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. He's saying to you and to me, let go. Let go. We let go so we can let ourselves be changed. So we can let ourselves be changed and transformed. You must let yourself go. I must let myself go. Because the reality is, in our past, we were graceless. We were in need of mercy, and we were never deserving of it. But yet mercy broke through, and God says to you, now that I have you, lay that life down. Be transformed every day. Come before me. And Paul is begging in these verses to us. He's, he's begging to our minds, and to our hearts, and to our spirits. Let go, be changed. And the outcome, here's the amazing part. The outcome says that when we don't conform, but rather we're transformed by the renewal of our mind, he says that by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. As a pastor, even for the short amount of time I've been in, or as a chaplain or working in medical ministry, I can't tell you the hours of counseling I've spent with people trying to figure out what God is up to in their lives. They come in wondering, what, is this the right path or is that the right path? Should I accept this job or turn down this job? Should I go to this college or that college? Should I marry this person or divorce that person? I mean, just constantly, the energy, the time that we put into it, where Paul says, hold on, I've got the answer for you. You're looking for the will of God? The will of God is found by the renewal of our minds. Daily realizing that mercy has changed us. Daily offering our lives as sacrifice. Daily making that our worship. Daily choosing not to conform, but rather be transformed. Do you see what's happening here in this verse? He's giving us the secret we've been looking for as a people and as a church, as individuals and as a community. He's saying here, by seeing where you've been, and seeing where you're going, we start to grasp what is good and acceptable and perfect. That will of God. And it doesn't mean we're always going to get it. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. Life is going to be hard. There's going to be difficult circumstances. There's going to be painful moments. We as a community are going to struggle at times. We're going to disagree over things. We're not going to always get along. We're not going to always like the way that it's going. Life has been hard and life has been difficult for you and for this church. But what Paul says is in the midst of that, we come back to this appeal to the mercies of God to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, worshiping him in this way, not conforming to the world, but daily renewing our minds so we can be transformed each day, every day when life is hard when circumstances are painful. This is where we are going to go personally, and this is where we need to go as a community. I read a story not too long ago about a writer named Theodore Geisel. 
He was grinding along, just trying to, to get his foot in the door as a writer back in the 1920s. He was living in Springfield, Illinois, and he was writing manuscripts and articles and whatever he could write. He was sending them out for jobs, sending them out to be bought and published. And he's getting turned down left and right. He, he's sending stuff to Life magazine and to newspapers and to sending manuscripts of books he had written. Just turn down, turn down, turn down. He was a pretty decent cartoonist, and he actually wrote a cartoon that got picked up by the Saturday Morning Press, and he made $25. And that was encouraging enough for him to uproot his wife and move to New York because that was the center of the publishing world. And he went there and just tried to sell his books, tried to sell his manuscripts, tried to have his, his articles picked up, and he could never seem to break through. Started working in commercials. The, the Second World War came, he actually joined the army and was a writer in the army for the press corps, but never seemed to make it as that author that he thought he could be, that he had the ability and the talent to be, and he kept coming to all these closed doors, getting turned down again and again. Almost 30 years after he began, he was reading a story in Life magazine, a magazine that actually turned him down several times. And it was talking about childhood illiteracy. And he became focused on this as a possibility for his writing. He had dabbled in it before. In fact, he had written 12 different children's books that all of which did not get picked up to be published. But he wrote one and he thought he may have something here. And he bumped into a friend. And like all good aspiring writers, he had his manuscript with him. And he said, look, I know I've given you stuff before, but I want to give you this manuscript. Just, just take a look at it. I think there may be something here. And the guy took it and he read it and he realized that he did have something very special. For the manuscript was called The Cat in the Hat. And the writer, Theodore Geisel, who we better know, by his pseudonym was Dr. Seuss. After 30 years of grinding, hitting closed doors and bump and pain and all the struggle, $25 is a success. He breaks through with these books. And here we stand all these years later where he's had 46 published books, four movies, six TV shows, and a Broadway show. His books have been printed and reprinted millions of times in over 50 languages. His final book that he wrote that was published not long after his death was called, Oh, the Places You'll Go. The story is that he actually wrote it for his son when he was graduating from high school. And so that's why a lot of times it gets given to high school seniors. Many of you have graduated, probably have 19 copies on your bookshelf. And you give it to high school seniors when they graduate. But it's this wonderful book of ups and downs and pains and struggles and how we just keep putting one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. I kept thinking about this book, getting ready for today, thinking about where you've been at a church and the time in this life that I join in and all the ups and downs and pains. And I think the book's fitting for us. If you don't know the story, it says this. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. It brains your head and feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you'll be the guy who decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care and about time you say, I don't choose to go there. For with your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down, not so any good street. And you may not find any you want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. See, it's opener there in the wide open air. And out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as footsy and brainy as you. And when things happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just roll right along and you'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who sort of great heights. And you won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang. You'll soon take the lead. Wherever you go, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. Except when you don't. Because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true that hang-ups and bang-ups, well, they can happen to you. You get all hung up in a prickly perch and your gang will fly and you'll be left in a lurch. And you come down from that lurch with an unpleasant bump and chances are then you'll be left in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun for unslumping yourself is not easily done. You come to a place where the streets aren't marked, some windows are lighted, but mostly they're dark. A place you can sprain with your elbow and chin. Do you dare stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you do go in, do you turn left or right or right in three quarters or maybe not quite? Or go back around and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not. I'm afraid you will find for a mind maker up or to make up his mind. You'll get so confused that you'll start to race down long, wiggled roads at a breaknecking pace. And you'll grind on for miles across weirdish, wild space, headed, I fear, towards the most useless place. The waiting place where people are just waiting. Waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow. Waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for the wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for a Friday night, or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake, a pot to boil, a better break, a string of pearls, a pair of pants, a wig with girls, another chance. Everyone is just waiting. 
But no, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying and find the bright place where the boom bands are planning, with banners flip flapping again you'll ride high, ready for anything out of the sky, ready because you're that kind of guy. Oh, the places you'll go. There's fun to be done. There's points to be There's games to be won. And all the magical things that you can do with the ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame! You'll be as famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. Except when they don't. Because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not. Alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance that you'll meet some things that'll scare you right out of your pants. There's some down the road between hither and yon that'll scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go though the weather be foul. On you will go though your enemies prowl. On you will go though the hack and cracks howl. Onward up many a frightening creek though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you'll hike and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems whatever they are. You get mixed up of course as you already know. Get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous or deft and never mix up your right foot from your left. Will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three-fourths percent guaranteed. Kids, we'll move mountains. So be your name Buxom or Bixby or Bray or Mordecai Ali Van Allen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is our day. Our mountain is waiting. So let's get on our way. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the grace the mercy, the love that you've given us that we do not deserve, that we could not ever earn, and you give it to us because you're that kind of God, deep in love, deep in passion, deep in wanting to know us and to draw us not only into relationship, but to release us into mission. I thank you for the gathering. Thank you for where they've been. I pray they don't ever have to go down it again. But we thank you for where they've been. And we pray, Father, that it prepares them for the ministry that you're about to unleash us into. Because you're going to bring people our way who need to know that there's a God who shows mercy and love. And he accepts them as they are, as they come, and wants them to know Jesus in an amazing way. Thank you for where we're going. We don't know it all yet, God, and we're going to mess up a bunch on the way. We believe and we trust that you're going to love us, forgive us, discipline us, and guide us through into a new season of sharing the great mercy of you shown solely through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. So excited to be here. I want to invite you back next week. Next week, we're going to start a series that's going to Take us all the way up to Easter. It's called Stuck. And we're going to be looking at things that we get stuck in sometimes. Um, circumstances, situations, things that hold us back and keep us from fully experiencing this mercy we've been talking about today. And each week we're going to be looking at a different person in the book of John who was stuck and how a meeting with Jesus unstuck them into a life of mission. So I hope you'll join us starting next week right back here. Until then, you guys are dismissed and we're thankful that you're here today. Bye-bye.